um, turn off your video uh, and stay muted uh, during the talk. Uh, the way the talks are going to work is that uh, the speaker has 15 minutes to, for the presentation. Uh, I will then give a, a five minute uh, warning to the speaker. That means you have five minutes to finish up. Uh, so that's be a total of 20 minutes. And then the last five minutes are meant for uh, discussions uh, and question and answer. So uh, without further ado, Jart, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, the virtual floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Ali. Yes, I'm Jart Kruger from the Department of Physics at the University of Victoria in South Africa. Um, Ali, before I start, I just want to make sure um, my talk um, was yeah, 25 minutes. So um, I prepared for a 20 minute talk. Is that fine? Yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. Okay. 20 minute talk is correct. Yes. I just, okay. I will give you a warning when you're at 15 minutes. That's all. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So thank you very much for the kind invitation to give a lecture at this conference. And it's a privilege for me to actually give the opening lecture at this conference. I'm looking, looking forward to participating in three days of stimulating science from African scientists, because I believe that Africa has a lot of potential and there's a lot of potential that we are going to show in these three days. Okay, right. So um, since biophysics is a relatively foreign concept to most physics students in Africa, <clears throat> I wanted to give some introduction to this exciting field of research. In particular, I'll give a brief introduction to quantum biology and nanobiophysics, which are relatively new research fields considered by many. I will focus mostly on quantum biology, which can be considered a subdomain of nanobiophysics. After a fairly brief introduction, I will give some examples from my own research in the context of photosynthesis and do this mainly from an experimental point of view. Okay. I guess that most of you might be asking what exactly is quantum biology? Quite simply, it's the application of quantum mechanics to biology. That is, quantum biology is the field of study that investigates processes in living organisms that cannot be accurately described by the classical laws of physics. And the emphasis here is on non-trivial quantum effects because obviously at the molecular and atomic scales, all types of matter, inanimate or animate, is governed by quantum mechanics. So we focus here on the, 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 the special case of non-trivial quantum effects. The renowned science writer Philip Ball from England has declared some nine years ago in a Nature News feature that quantum biology is a new field of science and it may be key to practical quantum computing and high efficiency solar cells. This research field actually started much earlier. In fact, it developed more or less alongside quantum mechanics. And here are just three of numerous interesting historical highlights. In 1932, Niels Bohr delivered his famous Light and Life lecture at the International Congress on Light Therapy in Copenhagen in Denmark. And then eight years later in 1944, Schrodinger published his well-known little book, What is Life? And then let's skip a few decades. And interestingly, Roger Penrose, whom you'll recognize as one of this year's Nobel laureates in physics, published a pretty controversial book in 1989, where he stated that consciousness is described by more than classical rules. In other words, it must involve quantum mechanics. Now, after 30 years of scientific advances, we know that this idea stated by Roger Penrose may be not so outrageous at all. I would then also highly recommend this headline review article, which reflects a little bit on the history of the field, but much more on the current state of the art and also the predicted future of quantum biology. Here are a few examples of processes featuring non-trivial quantum effects in biology. And there are perhaps many more similar processes in biological systems. So far, it's been very difficult to verify experimentally the existence of non-trivial quantum effects in most of these processes, but not for photosynthesis. Um, this, uh, these processes in photosynthesis, the primary processes of which I'm going to talk a bit today, 
they are the most vivid and convincing illustrations of quantum biology. Since these processes feature on the macromolecular scale, quantum biology can potentially have a huge impact on numerous technologies. What's very interesting is the fact that most of the key enabling technologies that the EU is seeking to realize are based on quantum mechanical phenomena and they find examples in nature. In other words, mankind is desperately seeking technological solutions which already exist in nature. So here are a few examples of what life can do that we cannot do yet. And due to the time limit, I'm only going to flash this information to you, but um, you're probably aware of the fact that these presentations are available on the ICP YouTube channel and on the conference page, or otherwise, if you want to have more information, please don't hesitate to contact me, and I'll be glad to do so. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, this, this slide shows a scheme of different hierarchies in biology, um, which I've shown here for, for plants. So you first see the plant cells here, and, and these green dots are the chloroplasts. You can remember that from your biology class at school. And then yeah, each of these chloroplasts, um, yeah, so there's an electron micrograph of such a chloroplast and a stacked membrane um, inside such a chloroplast. And inside these membranes are the photosystems, which are collections of proteins occurring inside these membranes and, and, and so on. So, so you see that um, these processes cover a typical, um, length scale of about 10 orders of magnitude and time scales ranging about 15 orders in magnitude. So this is already very interesting from a physics point of view. There's very broad range of spatial and time scales that can be accessed experimentally and by means of simulations. And even more from the viewpoint of a physicist, proteins are extremely interesting molecules because they are situated right here on the border between the classical and the quantum regimes. So proteins feature very interesting objects for studies of quantum biology. And it's of very much interesting to know how these quantum properties of them give rise to differences in the physiological function of these proteins. Okay, let's now have a brief look at the proteins in plants, uh, which are involved with the first steps of photosynthesis. Shown here is the photosystem one of plants viewed from the top, so on top of the membrane. And for clarity, the proteins have been removed and you see only the chlorophyll pigments here in green. They also surround a reaction center in the middle. And the purpose of this so-called antenna system is to enlarge the reaction center's absorption cross-section by two orders of magnitude. So after absorption of a photon, the excitation energy is first transferred amongst the pigments within the light harvesting antenna network. Then it's transferred to the pigments in the reaction center. And finally, the energy is trapped in the reaction center by means of charge separation. So let's now rotate the photosystem to 90 degrees to look at it along the membrane. So you see that the initial absorbed photo energy has been converted into a charge gradient or a potential difference across the membrane, which drives the rest of the energy fixation. And this whole process happens very rapidly within about 20 picoseconds in order to prevent charge recombination. And the quantum efficiency of this process is remarkably high, close to 100%, which means that the energy of every absorbed photon is used for photosynthesis. So when this process is repeated many times, you end up with an extremely powerful nanoscale biobattery. So the students can, can calculate the, 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 the um, um, yeah, what is the electric field that, that is caused by four nanometers, the width of a, of a membrane and 300 millivolts. It's, it's an extremely powerful electric field that is created through this process, just by means of a single charge separated event. Okay, these extremely high pigment densities in these photosystems give rise to so-called molecular excitons, 
which are excitations that are coherently delocalized over a few pigments. Let's consider two coupled two-level systems. In this case, we have two identical parallel dipoles with identical energies. When the interaction between these two dipoles is much stronger than their interaction with the phonon environment, this gives rise to energy splitting. And when this system is excited by a photon, so when it absorbs a photon, the photo energy will be coherently shared by both states, as shown by the wave function of the product state. Thing. The physiological benefits of this phenomenon or the formation of molecular excitons is far superior to the best man-made solar energy materials. For example, molecular excitons give rise to more efficient light absorption, faster energy funneling, which is faster conversion from short to long wave and spectral bands, faster energy transfer, and it increases the irreversible trapping of the excitations by the reaction center. So in other words, the overall efficiency of photosynthesis is increased dramatically by the formation of these molecular excitons. Let me give you an example of excitons in the context of diatoms, which are beautiful unicellular organisms amongst, uh, which are the, amongst the most common types of phytoplankton, which you get in, in all types of water environments. So using single molecule spectroscopy in combination with simulations and comparing the results with those of similar proteins in plants, we managed to demonstrate that these organisms use a much reduced exciton coupling strength between three key chlorophyll pigments inside this light harvesting complex, despite an extremely high pigment density. And this is done in order to enhance the light harvesting efficiency. This is quite remarkable that it's um, done by the system in this way because reduced excitonic coupling, reduction of excitonic coupling, um, specifically at this site within the, within the protein system, should actually render the proteins more sensitive to disorder. And one would therefore expect their efficiency to drop, the light of efficiency one expects to drop. But instead, these proteins are designed in a special way, a very special way as to utilize this reduced excitonic coupling to actually enhance the light harvesting efficiency. Really remarkable what they are doing. Okay, in a second example, um, this is on a topic of great interest in the field. So when you consider uh, that these photosynthetic systems are wet, noisy environments, you would not expect any long-term quantum coherence in these systems, but actually, there have been observations of long terms so of several picoseconds actually of, of quantum coherence during the processes of energy transfer and charge separation. And this type of quantum coherence is a different type of quantum coherence than the exciton states. So it's actually a quantum coherence of exciton states, or in other words, quantum coherence of quantum coherence, if you like. In the interest of time, I'm not going to dwell on this topic, but please do contact me if you'd like to, to, to know more, because a lot of research has been done on this, and, and there's a lot of interesting things that can be told about these processes. Okay, another topic we have embarked on is to coherently control excitation energy by using a pulse shaper to shape the intensity and amplitude of ultra short laser pulses. How this works is that we use two pulses, two laser pulses, in a scheme known as pump probe spectroscopy. The first laser pulse excites a carotenoid molecule inside the main light harvesting complex of plants. And then immediately after photoabsorption, two things can happen with the excitation. One is internal conversion, so just um, non-radiative decay of the excitation. And the other is energy transfer to a chlorophyll, to chlorophyll A in this case. So now by shaping the first pulse such that it interacts with the molecules for an extended time, this branching ratio can be controlled. And the two resulting states can then be probed by the second pulse to determine which state has been populated more. So the probe for the energy transfer to the chlorophyll is by means of ground state absorption. And the probe for the internal conversion pathway is 
ex, um, excited state absorption. So here are the two signals in a typical transient absorption um, spectrum. And when you now take the ratio between these two signals, um, that the ratio between the amplitudes, um, you can calculate the fitness. And we've managed to enhance this fitness of this ratio, energy transfer over internal conversion, by more than 20%. And the optimized pulse, so the one which gives rise to the maximum amount of fitness in this case, is the one um, actually has a very interesting structure. So here is shown the intensity of this pulse as a function of time. And it consists of seven sub pulses separated by 180 femtoseconds. What this suggests is that one or two slow vibrational modes of the carotenoid which is excited. Um, so some of these vibrational modes are used to control the branching ratio between the two processes, the two states that can be populated. <clears throat> Okay, in the last few minutes, I'll give a very brief introduction to nanobiophysics. So what is nanobiophysics? Well, the name basically says it all. It consists of something nano, something bio, and some physics. Since proteins are both bio and nano, when we study them using some physical tools, we are actually practicing nanobiophysics. In fact, all the examples I've shown so far are examples of nanobiophysics, so it's a pretty broad field. There's a strong fundamental scientific component to this research field, and often also a techno um, technological incentive. And the nano dimension is often strengthened by using metallic or semiconductor nanoparticles, um, such as what I'll show in the next example. So metallic nano, nano uh, rods, specifically have two oh, surface right. plastic you have, modes. You have five, about five minutes left. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah, so um, uh, metallic nano rods have two surface plasma modes, one along the long axis and one along the short axis. So when you change the length of the nano rod, the absorption and emission spectra can be shifted quite substantially. In one of our recent projects, we have chemically synthesized gold nano rods and spin coated them on a glass substrate. And on top of this, LH2, which is the main light harvesting complex of plants, was spin coated. And the dimensions of the gold nanorods were chosen such that the absorption band of the longitudinal plasmon mode overlapped strongly with the absorption and emission bands of LH2 to ensure optimal interaction or resonance between them. We then investigated the distant dependent interactions between a single nanorod and a single LH2 complex. And the physics behind the, uh, this idea is as follows. When you excite a metallic nanoparticle, the electromagnetic field is confined to the near field. So the nanoparticle effectively concentrates the light to within tens of nanometers from the surface, forming a so-called plasmonic hotspot. So when we now put a single protein, like LH2 in this example, in or near the plasmonic hotspot at the tip of a gold nanorod, the photoluminescence got enhanced by two orders of magnitude, as shown here on the right, compared to the case where a single protein, LH2 protein, was far from a nanoparticle. And this resonance enhancement is accompanied by a significant reduction in the resonance emission lifetime. So in other words, both the radiative and the non-radiative rates can be drastically tuned by using these surface plasmons. And the fluorescence enhancement is a product of excitation enhancement and emission enhancement, parameters that can be separately tuned, for example, by changing the nanoparticle size, its relative orientation, and its distance from the LH2 protein. In other words, these nanoparticles enable us to accomplish on-demand control of photosynthetic light harvesting. Right, in the last example, I'll show you really a cool experiment. We used light to switch a small protein called the orange carotenoid protein, OCP, to a photoactive state, which then allowed the protein to bind to a very large multi subunit protein called phycobilisome to switch off its photosynthetic activity. And all of this was done at the single protein level. Let me first demonstrate this at the bulk level. So OCP 
here inside a cuvette is first activated by blue light from an inactive orange form to a further activated red form. And this allows it to bind to the core of the phytobilisome complex. Um, and here is the spectrum of the active state without the OCP unbound, but when the OCP binds to the core, this um, fluorescence is quenched dramatically. So basically the photosynthetic activity switches off completely. So let's now illustrate this process at the single protein level by binding a single OCP complex to a single um, phycobilisome complex. So when you're using wild type OCP, um, we, we have managed to see in real time that upon blue light illumination, how the fluorescence is switched off completely. Now by using a, a, a mutant of OCP with a low binding affinity, we see not only how the fluorescence is switched off, but also the full recovery of the fluorescence in real time. So this is really fascinating. And what is even more fascinating is the fact that we can see a short living intermediate state between the active and the quench state, both when the fluorescence switches off and when it recovers. And the spectrum of this intermediate state, shown here in blue, contains two bands, one very blue shifted band and one very red shifted band. On the right, I compare, the, um, I compare two properties of, of this blue band, um, the, the, the degree of quenching and the, the amount of blue shift. I compare this with simulations of this process to get an idea of what would have happened. And what this shows, the experimental comparison with the simulations, shows that when the OCP couples to the phytobilisome core, um, the, the coupling between the subunits in the phytobilisome core significantly decreases. So in other words, this process signifies a docking mechanism of OCP upon binding and unbinding from phytobilisome. And how this docking mechanism works is that after blue light activation of OCP, when it encounters a phytobilisome complex, at least one of the phytobilisome rods temporarily weakens its coupling to the core, possibly by rotating or physically slightly moving away from the core in order to create space for this small protein OCP to bind to the core of phytobilisome. Okay, so let me wrap this up. And I have some take home messages um, in particular for the students here. Uh, the experimental and theoretical tools offered by physics are leading to groundbreaking discoveries in biology. So I hope that you have recognized this throughout the talk. And bio quantum biology is an excellent example of how the tools of physics lead to a paradigm shift in our understanding of some biological processes. And then nanobiophysics is another emerging field with tremendous potential for fundamental scientific as well as disruptive technological advances. And then this was shown in the context of photosynthesis. And I hope that I managed to convince you that photosynthetic proteins are extremely interesting systems from a physics point of view. So if I have another minute left, I just want to acknowledge everyone who has contributed to this work. The first of postgraduate students in my group, and some of them actually those who contribute, contributed to this specific work, and then also the collaborators below. Some of the experimental work was done in Amsterdam with phytobilisome and OCP samples were prepared um, in this lab in France. The diatom samples were provided by Claudia Bijo, and the LG2 samples were provided by Erika Baldio from Algatec. And of course, I'd also like to acknowledge all the funders that were involved. And finally, the group members. And thank you very much for listening. I'd be very glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Jart, uh, for your very interesting talk. I have a virtual clap for you right there. Um, okay, so uh, we have a, a bit of time for some questions. Uh, remember that at the end of the session, there's also going to be an extended, uh, a longer time to ask questions. But uh, so the floor is open for questions. Um, you can either, uh, okay, so there are a couple of questions rolling in from the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the first one. If I understand correctly, uh, there was there was a, a picture you showed of a, a graph that looked symmetric intensity versus time, uh, and uh, the would ask, yes, what the explanation is for that. 
intensity versus time. Oh, oh yeah, that one um, for the coherent control. Uh, that yes. one. Let me see. Okay. Um, sorry. So the question was to, to explain yeah. more of what's going yeah, on there. Exactly. How do you explain? Okay. Right, so yeah, it's very interesting that uh, a symmetric graph was obtained. This was obtained from a so-called frog trace where you can see the full spectrum of the, the optimal pulse as a function of time. So basically um, that the whole pump pulse, so this is a two pulse experiment. The first pulse is the pump pulse and the, the pulse which gave rise to uh, an optimal fitness, as you can see here, it's fetched out in time. So if we take this and from this point to that point, it's stretched out in about 1.2 femtoseconds and it is symmetric about time zero and it consists of seven sub pulses. Um, so, so this frequency of these sub pulses is, is um, 120 femtoseconds, more or less exactly, which means that what is actually happening during this process is that a vibrational mode is driven and since we have excited carotenoid, it must be a vibrational mode within this molecule. And 120 femtoseconds is relatively slow for vibrational mode. So these are uh, vibrational modes in the backbone of the carotenoid. So somehow, we, we are still um, doing more research on this. So somehow these um, slow vibrational modes give rise to the fact that the, the conical intersection between the, the two states into which this excited state can relax. Um, this, um, this, this conical intersection is tuned by these um, vibrational modes. In other words, there must be some type of vibrational coupling um, with the excited state. And why it's so very symmetric, I think that is just um, very interesting um, from a physics point of view. Um, and probably just because uh, yeah, most, most processes in nature are symmetric. Uh, and this is just um, substantiating the fact that symmetry plays a very important role in nature. Um, yeah, I hope that this gives adequate information about this. Um, if not, please contact me and I, I will definitely give you more information on this. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, there's maybe time for just one more question. Uh, Omololo asks uh, for an example in quantum biology where quantum coherence slash incoherence is important. Okay, I suppose that he's referring to this long living quantum coherence between exciton states. Uh, let me see if I can quickly go back there. Um, uh, no, it's a bit earlier, sorry. Um, now, where's that? Oh yeah, I, I'm sorry, let, let me quickly go to that slide. Uh, it's this one. Yeah, so I suppose that this process is referred to. So, um, okay, there's been a, a lot of hype in the beginning. Um, let me say just after publication of this, this very first paper and a lot of experimental and theoretical studies and the, the current um, consensus in the field is that there's, there's no such thing as long living quantum coherence of electronic of the electronic type. Um, most of this coherence is of a vibrational nature. So uh, actually a Raman type of vibration, ground state vibrations, which is uh, not interesting at all, but there is some indication of coupling between these vibrational states and electronic states leading to so-called vibronic coherence. Um, also extending to a few hundreds of femtoseconds or even picoseconds. And um, this has been shown for excitation energy transfer inside these light harvesting antenna complexes um, in all sorts of photosynthetic organisms, ranging from plants to algae, cyanobacteria, or almost any type of, of system. And it has also been shown for the reaction center. So these are the biological systems in which this type of long-term coherence has been observed. But there are also um, theoretical studies um, which um, hypothesized that similar behavior must take place in, in some other systems, for example, in, in, in microtubules. And there's also another type of process in, in magnetoreception um, where the vibrational modes of the environment also plays a very important, um, a very important role um, to give orientation to a bird during <clears throat> long, um, long time 
flights, for example, from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. So there are a lot of these cases where the very specific vibrational modes or phonon modes in the environment coupled to electronic modes and give a definite indication of physiological benefits to these organisms. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'd love to continue this discussion. <laughs> we'll leave it uh, to the end of the session. Thank you again, Chart, for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, so our ne uh, next speaker um, is